In this video, we continue our discussion of the guidelines and requirements for the response paper assignments. Specifically, we will be concerned here with a variety of technical issues having to do with the proper use of outside sources and how to cite them correctly, the need for in-text citations, some discussion about paraphrasing an author's work, and some points about plagiarism. At various points in this video, I will reference the Response Paper Guidelines document, which you can find posted to the Blackboard page for our class. I will begin by explaining further details about the bibliography section of the response papers. Recall that your response paper must have three sections explanation, analysis, and bibliography. You can see here that I've begun by outlining my paper with these three exact section headings. So, what needs to go in your bibliography section? In this section, you need to provide the bibliographic information for every source you cite in your paper. And what sources are you required to cite? Well, there is only one source that you're absolutely required to use and cite in your paper, and that is the particular reading that you are writing your paper about. You are permitted to use sources besides this if you choose, however, doing so is not required. For the most part, your writing should be focused specifically on the argument of the person that you will be criticizing in your paper. In this case, for purpose of illustration, we are imagining that I am writing a response paper that critiques the article entitled Seven Arguments Against Extra Credit by Christopher Pines. So the bibliographic information for this paper must be included in my bibliography section. However, you might ask, how do I know what that bibliographic information is? To assist you in this, I have provided all the bibliographic information for every reading that you can write a response paper about in the response paper guidelines document that is posted in the syllabus and course information area of Blackboard. You can find this information in the bibliography section of this document. In this section, you can see that I have listed all the bibliographic information that you will need. You can see here that the bibliographic information for the article from Pines is listed here along with that information for all the other readings in the course. So I could simply copy this information and then paste it into my paper. Now we see that the bibliography section of my paper is filled out with the citation information for Pine's article. Suppose, however, that I end up using sources besides this in my paper. Again, you are not required to do this. You don't have to use any outside sources. But if you do use other sources, then those would need to be cited as well. Furthermore, if you return to the response paper guidelines, then you can see that I have provided a number of examples for how to cite different kinds of sources that are not found in the particular readings for our class. So if you do use an outside source, then you can follow these examples when providing the citation information in the bibliography section of your paper. In addition to having the correct bibliographic information, for any source you use in your paper in the bibliography section, you are also required to have in-text citations in your paper. Now the first question you probably have is, how do I know when I need an in-text citation? The rule to follow here is this. Whenever you claim that some author makes some statement or believes something to be true or asserts some claim, in general, whenever you attribute some claim to an author, you must provide an in-text citation which provides evidence of that attribution. The way to think about this is the following. If you claim that some author argues that X is true, or claims that X is true, or believes that X is true, 
then the evidence that you have of this must come from the text. That is, there must be somewhere in the text where the author states that he or she believes that X is the case. Furthermore, that means that this statement must be found on some specific page. So whenever you attribute any sort of claim to an author, you need to provide an in-text citation which indicates the page on which that claim is found. Furthermore, the way you will do this is by writing in parentheses the author's last name and the page number on which the claim you are referencing can be found. If the source in question is one which does not have page numbers, such as an online encyclopedia or a news article, then you would simply put the author's name in parentheses. To see this, let's return to the hypothetical response paper that I am writing. By way of introduction, maybe I will start my paper in the following way. In an article entitled Seven Arguments Against Extra Credit, Christopher Pines argues for the thesis that college professors never have any good reason to permit students to complete extra credit assignments. In this sentence, I provide a general description of the conclusion that Pines argues for in his article. Notice that following this general description, I have written Pines' last name along with the page number I am referring to. It may also be helpful to see, in Pine's actual article, the portion of the text that I am referring to in this statement. On page 191, Pines writes, I explore this tension and ultimately argue for an anti-extra credit thesis. Extra credit is pedagogically unjustified and should not be used. Another way to express the claim is, there are no good arguments for the use of extra credit assignments in the college classroom. You will notice here that the sentence I have in my paper, which is a paraphrase of this statement by Pines, does not repeat his exact words, but it does accurately represent the meaning that he is conveying in this passage. Because you need to provide an in-text citation, each time you attribute a claim to an author, it may happen that you could have multiple in-text citations one after another in the same paragraph. In fact, since in many cases you might reference statements that an author makes in different parts of the article, this really will not be an uncommon occurrence. To see what I mean, consider the following continuation of the introductory paragraph of my paper that I had started previously. In an article entitled Seven Arguments Against Extra Credit, Christopher Pines argues for the thesis that college professors never have any good reason to permit students to complete extra credit assignments. While Pines offers a myriad of arguments against extra credit assignments, seven to be exact, one of these arguments applies specifically to using bonus questions on exams and is referred to as the failure in conception argument. In essence, Pines concludes with this argument that bonus questions on exams are either mere grade inflation or otherwise these questions fail to qualify as extra credit in the first place. Here I attribute three different claims to Pines and because those claims occur on three different pages of his article, I need to provide three different in-text citations. This may not always be necessary. In some cases, you might spend an entire paragraph of your paper explaining points that are all found on the same page. In that case, simply providing an in-text citation at the end of the paragraph would be perfectly fine. However, if in a single paragraph of your paper you reference claims from multiple pages of the author's writing, then each of those should receive a separate in-text citation. One thing you will notice is that none of my in-text citations are for direct quotations. That is, at no point did I directly take Pine's words and place them into my paper with quotation marks. This is because direct quotations are not allowed for this assignment. 
The reason for this is not because direct quotations are necessarily bad in themselves. There are definitely times where it makes sense to use them. However, because of the relatively short length of this assignment, I do not want you to take up space using direct quotations. Instead, I want you to see that you have the ability to put the points the author is making into your own words in a way that demonstrates your own comprehension and understanding of the text. So, in this case, you would not want to do the following in order to explain this passage to the reader. You would not want to write, Christopher Pines argues that, quote, there are no good arguments for the use of extra credit assignments in the college cl classroom, end quote. Instead, you would want to paraphrase Pine's statement by putting it into your own words. For example, Christopher Pines argues for the thesis that college professors never have any good reason to permit students to complete extra credit assignments. I will say that in this particular example, the difference between a direct quotation and a paraphrase is not overly significant. This is because this example merely deals with a statement of Pine's thesis and is relatively straightforward, not overly complex, and pretty easy to understand. However, that will not always be the case with philosophical writing. In many cases, the readings we will do in this class will contain passages that make much deeper, more sophisticated, and nuanced philosophical claims. In these cases, I want to see that you can paraphrase what the author is saying in a way that accurately portrays their ideas, shows your comprehension of, that, of those ideas, and shows that you are thinking actively about what the author is saying and what the author is arguing. However, I will have more to say on this point in the next video, where we discuss how to explain a philosophical argument. I will now say a few things about plagiarism and the use of external sources. Let's begin with plagiarism. Plagiarism can be defined as any action which portrays the work of someone else as one's own work. And this can occur either unintentionally or intentionally. In the case of unintentional plagiarism, this would likely involve failing to provide a citation for material that is taken from some source. The intent to steal another's work may not be there, this could just be an accident, but the effect is the same nonetheless. Without proper attribution to the source of the material in question, it seems to all appearances that another person's ideas are actually your own. This sort of plagiarism can be easily avoided, however, by following the guidelines for citation explained earlier in this video. Now, what is more serious is intentional plagiarism. This occurs when someone deliberately takes another's words or ideas and states them as if they were that person's own words or ideas. In the context of an academic assignment, this most commonly occurs when a student finds material through a web search and copies it into their paper. I take plagiarism very seriously. I look for it, and any student who plagiarizes will receive a zero on that assignment, among other possible penalties. As such, it is your responsibility as a student to ensure that both intentional and unintentional plagiarism are avoided. Any material that you draw from some other source, whether it be the reading or some other external source, must be cited. However, even if all the material you take from another source is properly attributed and cited, there is still a further caveat to keep in mind. Specifically, not all sources are created alike, and some types of sources are not permitted on this assignment. Only sources that have been peer-reviewed are appropriate for academic settings. So, for example, Wikipedia, blogs and online discussion forums, or online class notes posted by other professors, whatever virtues these sources may have, are not peer-reviewed sources and, as such, should not be used. And again, it really is important to remember 
that you are not required to use any source other than the assigned text for this assignment. In fact, in some cases, perhaps many cases, using outside sources may simply detract from doing a close reading and analysis of the text itself, which is really the main point of this assignment. You should never rely on external sources to the point where you are no longer demonstrating to me your own understanding of the material. However, if you are looking for some further reading or some outside sources to help you and to draw upon, then there are two websites I would recommend which are both linked on the response paper guidelines document. These are the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy and the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. The latter of these is usually aimed more at a beginner level, but both have a wide variety of peer-reviewed entries on a wide variety of philosophical topics. Before ending, this would be a good time to take a look at the rubric that I will use to grade your papers. The general breakdown of the grading is the following. Your response paper will be given a score out of 50 points. The basic requirements category will be worth 20 points. The explanation category will be worth 15 points. And the analysis category will also be worth 15 points. For the moment, we will not worry about the grading for the explanation and analysis categories. Discussion of this will be reserved for subsequent videos. However, if we take a look at the basic requirements category, we can see that we have covered all the items that are graded under this heading so far. And when you are writing your paper, I would encourage you to treat the questions asked here like a checklist. Does your paper respond to the prompt? Do you meet the word requirement? Do you have the right section headings? Do you have a bibliography section with all sources cited properly? Do you have in-text citations for all paraphrases? And do you avoid using any direct quotations? When grading your paper, I will treat your ability to do all these basic tasks as a minimum baseline for competency in this assignment. Of course, doing these things may be necessary for scoring well on the assignment, but it is certainly not sufficient, it is not enough. As such, in subsequent videos I will go into more detail about what I am looking for in the explanation and analysis portions. What is the proper way to explain a philosophical argument? And what should you keep in mind when criticizing a philosophical argument?